So if you've got your Bible, turn with me to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. And we're going to pick up in verse number 8 tonight. Romans chapter 1, verse number 8. The Bible says this, and this is the Apostle Paul speaking. It says, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of His Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow, by God's will, I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you, that is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you, as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. All right, we're going to stop there for today. So our, again, our lesson tonight, as we comb through just these few verses, we're going to see eight, really nine marks of spiritual leadership. And so I'm reminded as I studied through this passage this past week, there were men after I was converted that the Lord just strategically placed in my life. Uh, men who were in ministry in different ways, whether it be a pastor or Sunday school teacher. And every single one of these men that I remember, I learned something from. Either the, the way that things should be done or the way things shouldn't be done. And God put all these different men in my life, and some of them I still lean on their example. I get into certain situations and I call them and say, Hey, you know, what, have you ever been in this situation? And they offer really good advice scriptural insight. I learned about in ministry what priorities that a man should have, what convictions that we should have. I learned about devotion. I've seen how they ordered their life and in different ways. And there's one man in particular that I looked to. I began to notice in his life that he really didn't care about pleasing men at all. He was solely concerned about pleasing the Lord. He was a very good example. Uh, but tonight, I'm not going to be telling you about that fellow. I'm going to be sharing an example of the Apostle Paul, who is also a really great example of spiritual leadership uh, here in the Bible. Now, again, we're here in Romans chapter 1, and uh, we're going to look at a good example. So, there may be people here tonight that want a good godly example to follow. So maybe you didn't have a good godly example in your life of, uh, maybe your dad was a great moral guy, but he really didn't lead the family spiritually. Like here, Paul, Paul shows it. Maybe somewhere along the way, you look to a spiritual leader as a pastor, and they let you down. That happens many times, sadly. Thankfully, Paul gives us a really solid example that we can look to and model our lives after. And so, that's where we're at tonight. When we look at Paul's life and his ministry, we understand that the reason why he did the things he did was ultimately to glorify the Lord. He didn't enter into ministry because he thought it was fun at all. He didn't serve in order to get glory, to kind of build his reputation. That's not why he did it. Listen to this. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Verse number 16. It says, For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of. For I am under compulsion, and woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. So, again, if I could give you any good biblical example in Scripture of spiritual leadership beyond Christ, it would be the Apostle Paul. So let's begin here in Romans chapter 1, verse number 8. I want you to see these nine marks of spiritual leadership. And what I want you to do as we go through this is to ask yourself, if you're a man here tonight, then you need to ask the question, are these marks in my life? God has called every man to be a good godly example for his family, for his community, and also within his church. So my question to men tonight is this, 
Are these priorities, are these marks true in your life? And to piggyback off that question, I want you to look at the spiritual leadership in your life. So ladies, think about your husbands. Uh, think about your Sunday school teachers. Think about your pastors. Do they bear these marks in their life? And if they are, glorify the, praise the Lord for that. And if they're not, pray for them. This should encourage you to pray for the spiritual leaders in your life. So number one, what do we see? Verse number eight. It says, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you. The first mark of a spiritual leader is someone who has a thankful heart. Their heart's filled with gratitude. Now, what was the Apostle Paul thankful for? What does verse number 8 say? Right. So, let me, let me summarize that. What was the Apostle Paul thankful for? Paul was grateful for what God has done in his life. He was also thankful for what God had done in and through him. He was thankful for his ministry. But not only that, he was also thankful for what God was doing in the lives of other, other people. A spiritual leader, a biblical spiritual leader, is thankful for conversion. They're thankful in how God is continuing to work in their life. And he's thankful how God's working all around them. So in their family, in their church, in their workplace. So Paul was a thankful person. Notice what he says though in verse number 8. Let's dig a little deeper. He says, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. Notice his thankfulness was intimate. What I mean by that is he says, I thank my God. So this guy had a personal relationship with Christ. He spent time with the Lord. He was devoted to the Lord. Again, it was personal. Not only that, notice also, as a spiritual leader, Paul was thankful for people. We see that in verse number 8. A spiritual leader, like Paul, let me, let me use him as an example. So when he wrote letters to a bunch of different churches, all of them had a lot of different issues but he always seemed to find something good to say about them in that letter. He always looked for something good within the people. You know, a spiritual leader, this is super convicting, a spiritual leader thinks better about other people. So yeah, they may have a train wreck of a life, but they look and see how God is working and they capitalize on that, and they encourage, and they fan that flame. That was the case for Paul. He was a thankful person. He was also thankful despite his circumstances. Do you remember when Paul wrote Romans? Do you remember some of the circumstances in Paul's life? I mean, literally, I didn't dig in too much into the context in order to, to bring it to you guys. Well, let me rephrase that. I didn't prepare to share with you the context of exactly where Paul was in many of these situations. I read about the different prisons uh, that Paul was in and all the different sanitary uh, situations. It, it was disgusting. So the first time we find Paul in prison, he was actually in a home. So it wasn't too bad. He was chained to a guard. We've all heard that story. But later on in life, when Paul was in prison, I knew it was trash. It was disgusting. But every time he's writing these letters, what's he doing? He's still very thankful. There's gratitude flowing from his heart. He's still thankful. Why? What was the reason for Paul's thankfulness? Look at your Bibles in Romans chapter 1, verse number 8. It says, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you. Why? Because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. Apparently, in A.D. 49, Emperor Claudius kicked out the Jews from Rome. And so the Jewish people, the converted Jews, the professing Jews, when they get kicked out of Rome in A.D. 49, they're carrying this gospel message, the good news with them. And so then the gospel, even in a bad situation, God uses to spread and to scatter the seeds of the gospel. So this was the testimony of the early church. This was the testimony of the church at Rome. Do you see that in verse number 8? 
your faith is proclaimed in all the world. You know, churches are known by a lot of different things. Some churches are known because of who their pastor is. Some churches are known because of where their building is located, on the side of a lake, or because of stained glass windows. Or I can remember a church in North Carolina that was known because they had a million dollars in the bank. Like that was, I, that was how the church was known. But that wasn't the case for the church at Rome. They were famous because of their faith. And verse number 8 describes that for us. All right, let me apply this before we move on to our next point. We have to understand that anyone who serves the Lord, whether it be in pastoral ministry, whether it be a deacon in the church, whether it be someone who takes up uh, the giving, whoever it is, we have to understand that our service must be driven by gratitude. Gratitude for what the Lord's done in our life. Gratitude uh, for what He's doing around us. What happens when you try to serve the Lord without a heart rooted in thankfulness? Do you know what will eventually happen? Some of us may, be, uh, may have experienced this in the past. If you serve without gratitude for what Christ has done in your life, your service to the Lord will lack joy. Have you ever seen someone who serves without joy? I'll never forget some of the VBS workers growing up. Like literally you go through the line. You're like, imagine a little boy wearing glasses and braces at the same time. Super embarrassing, but it was me. Go through the line, hand them my styrofoam plate. And they're just slapping the sloppy joes on there. Why were they serving? Because they had to be there. Like, that's no way to serve the Lord. We serve out of gratitude. Without thankfulness driving us, we end up resentful and bitter in the end. So how can we cultivate thankfulness in our service? So maybe you're not in pastoral ministry, but the Lord has called you to ministry and to minister. Maybe it be within the home, uh, serving babies, teaching kids. I don't know. But how can you serve with heart filled with thankfulness? What do we need to do? This is how you need to serve. This is how you can cultivate thankfulness and gratitude in your heart. Number one, focus on what God's doing in your life. You need to stop and remember all the good things that God has given to you. He's met your greatest need through Jesus Christ. That cultivates thankfulness in your heart. So that's number one. So not only focus on what God has done in your life, turn your attention away from yourself and focus on what God's doing in other people's life. And then remember how God's kingdom is continuing to advance in the world. If, you, if you'll take time to think about how God has loaded your wagon spiritually, how He's continuing to work in people all around you, and how He's continuing to work globally, it will produce gratitude in your heart. Alright, so the first mark of a spiritual leader is, is a thankful heart. Is that true for you, spiritual leader? Man, do you serve with a thankful heart? Or are you just bitter and resentful? Hey, I'm doing it. I don't have to have joy. That's wrong. Number two, also, we see in Paul's life a concerned spirit. Look at verse number 9. The Bible says, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of His Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you. So again, here's Paul. And he's talking about Verse number 9, he says, Whom I serve, that ser word serve in Greek can also mean worship. He says, Whom I worship, how? With my spirit and the gospel of His Son. One of the main ways Paul served was in preaching the gospel. Here's the point. Let me just back up. Paul had a concerned spirit about what? He wanted every single person to have the opportunity to hear the gospel and to respond to the gospel in faith. A true spiritual leader, that's also a great burden and a desire in their heart. 
So again, Paul, as a spiritual leader, was known for his love and his concern for other people and their salvation. And then he says this. He says, Without ceasing, I mention you always in my prayers. What does that mean? Paul knew that even the most mature believers have the potential to stumble and fall. So Paul never took anybody off his prayer list. Paul was, had a concerned spirit, not only to get the gospel to him, but to continue to sustain growth within the church. A true spiritual leader doesn't just hope everybody will come in and get saved and then just go on without their life. A true spiritual leader is in it for the long haul. He wants to continue to see people grow in holiness. Is that the case in your life, spiritual leader? Is that the case for the pastors at this church? Are we just all about reaching, or are we concerned about teaching and encouraging as well? All right. There's a question on your paper. Um, does everybody have a paper? All right. It says, what specifically did Paul pray for? when he prayed for other believers. Uh, right on your page, I think I may have already wrote it down, Ephesians chapter 3, is that on there? Right, so that's a very helpful passage to go to. Uh, hey, well, how can I pray for other people, especially within the church? That passage tells you that Paul prayed for, and I'll just summarize it if you want to write it on your paper. He prayed that God would strengthen other believers. He prayed that Christ would reign in their hearts so that people would be saved. That they would be filled with God's love and that they would look like Christ. Those are the four main things Paul prayed for for the church. You know, I can remember growing up different pastors and different men that invested in my life and I would just get text messages. I still to this day get a text message on my birthday from this fella who I haven't seen and probably since Emily and I got married, which has been a while. And he always just says, hey man, love you. I'm proud of what God's doing in and through your life. And that's, that's a good spiritual leader. Like he has, he invested in just a season, but he never forgot. He continued to invest. He continues to pray. And so you're filling a blank on your paper. That, that reminded me of this. We learn the depth and the intensity of prayer measures the depth and intensity of concern and love. So if you have somebody that will pray for you, that's a person that is concerned about you. That's a person that, that loves you. You want to measure your love as a leader? Do you pray for your people? Do you pray for your family? If you don't, then your measure of love is pretty low. All right, number three, another mark of a spiritual leader is submission to God's Spirit and His will. Verse number 10, he says, Always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will, you see the word there? God's will, I may now at last succeed in coming to you. So Paul, as a spiritual leader, wanted to be an instrument in God's hand. He wanted to be used by God. There's, this is where many people fall short in, in any form of service. I find that many times in the church, people are more willing to give money than they are to actually hit the mission field. I, I have found that there's a lot of people who find it easier to pray for someone to go and witness than to pray, Lord, would you use me? You see, that was the case for the Apostle Paul. He wanted, not for somebody else to have to go, he wanted to be the one that went. He had the attitude of Isaiah. And I hope, hope every person here tonight would adopt the attitude of Isaiah. Listen to what he says. Isaiah chapter 6, verse number 8. Isaiah saw a spiritual need, and this is what the Bible says. Here am I, send me. Man, how would, how would churches change if people saw a spiritual need and said, all right, here I am, send me, Lord. Not, Lord, please, please raise up somebody to uh, serve in the nursery. 
because you know I'm just I used to serve, but you know I've just kind of graduated out of that now. What? What about having a spirit like Isaiah? Okay, there's a need. The Lord's still giving me breath. I'm not dead. I can still be used by God. And when He's done with me, He'll take me out. So again, that shouldn't be the case for us. Something else I want to point out in verse number 10. Let me read it again. It says, Always in my prayers, asking that somehow, by God's will, I may now at last succeed in coming to you. Paul sought God's will in ministry. And that's very important for those in spiritual leadership. In the home, it's very important that you seek God's will. In the church, it's very important that you seek God's will. Paul did things in ministry not to cater to his own desire or to his own agenda. He wanted always to default to the one whom he served, which is Christ. He wanted to do what God wanted. The reason why I bring this up is because when we talk about leaders in the church today, most people are so focused on leaving a legacy and building a reputation. A lot of pastors go to church and they want it to grow, grow, grow. Why? They're not concerned about souls being saved. They're concerned about their name and their reputation. And they use churches as stepping stones to continue to increase their salaries. Have you ever thought about that? Maybe you haven't. But I see it in ministry firsthand. That's not the way it's supposed to work. Why, why would they do this? Just, just stand back sometime and, and watch church leaders. We see a lot of church leaders who want to, to always think big. Like, hey, let's, let's bust the walls out and let's do this and that. And, but rarely do we see a biblical leader whose plans are restricted by God's will. Have you ever thought about that? We've bought into this consumer mindset that bigger is always better. I want you to look at Christ's ministry, which was always submissive to the Father's will. When we look at Christ's ministry, He didn't focus on converting the huge political leaders. He didn't focus on always going to the big cities. How did Christ's ministry work? He chose 12 ordinary men and He invested in their lives. He didn't go big. He started small. Because he wanted disciples that weren't an inch deep and a mile wide. He wanted 12 disciples who were deep, who could take this message to the ends of the earth. Most of Christ's teaching took place in insignificant, isolated parts of Palestine. Again, contrary to the model that we see today. Let's go to the big cities. Let's get... No. Christ didn't raise large sums of money or attempt to manipulate influential men for His own agenda. His sole purpose was to do the Father's will, the Father's way, and the Father's time. And a true biblical leader, that's His goal as well. He doesn't just ramrod building projects or change this and that just to, again, make a name for Himself. He wants to do it God's way with God's money, and in God's timing. That's our highest goal as well. All right, let's keep moving. Number four, a spiritual leader also has a loving spirit. All right, look at verse 11. The Bible says, For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. My question here, after reading verse 11, why did Paul want to go to Rome? Anybody know? To encourage them? Okay. So what you're saying, Miss Beth, is he didn't want to go as a tourist. He wasn't there to watch the chariot races. He wasn't there to sightsee. No, he was there right, to give of himself, right? He wasn't there to entertain or to indulge himself. I want you guys to see that's the mindset of service and ministry. 
as a servant of Christ and whatever ministry is given to you, God has placed you in that ministry to be filled up as you read the Word and then to be poured out. Whether it be in the context of the home, whether it be pastoral ministry, wherever it's at. See, the problem is many of us have a wrong view of ministry. If you look at ministry as simply a way to receive appreciation, you're going to be disappointed pretty quick. But what we need to understand is that the ministry God has given to us, He's given to us to serve sacrificially. Even though we receive no appreciation or no credit for it. And that would be helpful, right? To adopt that mindset and attitude. Think about, just think about a mom. Man, I can be, if I am completely honest, man, moms, well, I can just speak about Miss Emily. Like, there are certain things that get done that many times get overlooked by eight other people in the home. There's one person who's sacrificially serving, and the rest of us just dirty clothes and dirty dishes, and we don't even think. But as a mom, I'm just using this as an example, like, it, w it is helpful to adopt the mindset of, hey, I'm sacrificially serving. This is, this is my ministry in this season of life. But if you just do all those things to receive appreciation, what's going to happen? You're going to become discouraged and depressed. We're to give of ourselves sacrificially. Listen to this. This was Paul's goal in ministry. This is Colossians chapter 1, verse number 28. This was Paul's goal. He said to present every man complete in Christ. And for this pur purpose also I labor, striving according to His power which mightily works within me. Paul's goal in ministry was to present people holy before God. To com a complete man. And that involved loving. That involved sacrificial giving. Paul was willing, as a spiritual leader, to empty out all his resources on behalf of his people. Do you see those marks of the spiritual leaders in your life who are willing to give everything, willing to be spent and even die for them if necessary? If you cannot look at your husband and say, man, he would die for me, there is a spiritual issue. If you can't look to the men in your life and say, man, they are giving themselves 100%, then there is something spiritually wrong. If there's a rumble in the night and you nudge your wife to get up, can I just say, like there are some issues there? I sat under a preacher one time who admitted to that Man, I still, to this day, I don't respect them. Because the reality is that's really how their marriage worked. If that's the case, we need to have a conversation after the time tonight. All right. Let's keep going. Look at verse number 11. He says, For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some sort of spiritual gift to strengthen you. What's Paul referring to when he talks about a spiritual gift? What sort of spiritual gift is he wanting to give the church at Rome? Well, there's different things. Uh, maybe it's preaching. Maybe it's teaching. Maybe it's exhorting them, comforting them, praying, guiding, disciplining. It could be a number of different things. But the point is, he loved them. He loved them enough to go and to invest in them and to pour himself out. I heard a story not too long ago about a Sunday school teacher. And this Sunday school teacher was always known for saying, hey, I love my Sunday school class. I love my Sunday school class. Well, eventually, this man found himself on a Saturday, again, consumed with his hobby. And because this hobby consumed most of his Saturdays, his free day, he found himself preparing for his Sunday school lesson very little. And the Lord convicted him about how little he really loved his students, and in that he wouldn't invest eternally in them. He would invest in temporal things. He would invest in his hobby, which is temporary. So from that point on, he determined to make whatever sacrifice was necessary 
to give those students something of eternal importance. That was the case for Paul. He was willing to let go of the temporal things in order that he could invest in people that would pay off through all eternity. That's this kind of sacrifice Paul had for the church. Can I ask you a question before we go on? If I ask people in and around your life, hey, is, is that person, are you, are you sacrificial in that way? Are you willing to give up sleep, Sunday naps? I, I don't know what it is. But are you willing to give up those things in order to serve? Another question. Moving it away from personal. Are those in areas of spiritual leadership marked by this kind of sacrificial love? If you look at your leadership here at this church, think about your Sunday school teacher. Can you honestly say, man, they're willing to give up a lot of stuff in order that they can study for the Sunday school lesson? Can you honestly say, man, they put the time in? Can you say that about other areas of spiritual leadership? All right, number five, let's move on. Another mark of spiritual leadership is humility. Look at verse 12. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. So what Paul's explaining here is that when he visits the church at Rome, yeah, he's going to encourage them and invest in them, but he's also going to receive encouragement as well. How? How would Paul be encouraged by this church? He says he's going to be in verse number 12. Think about this with me. I want you to notice the humility. Here's a highly gifted man. The Apostle Paul was very highly gifted. God greatly used this man. Yet he never thought he was above being encouraged by other believers. Even other immature believers. I mean, he was humble. Paul was the kind of guy that never held his position. He never held his education his giftedness above the ones that he served. Do you see that in Paul's life? Like he was a highly trained guy. Yeah, he didn't, he wasn't arrogant about it. He was a humble guy. He sought to be just a common man. Paul was one of the greatest theologians the world's ever known. Yet still one of the most humble men that we've ever known. Here's a man who was blessed more than most, yet he had no stain of spiritual pride or arrogance. And so when I read about Paul, like I want to learn from this guy. Like how? How does he do this? Because Paul knew he had not arrived. Until the Lord called him home, he still had so much room to grow. And that's a great lesson for spiritual leaders. You don't have it all together. I don't have it all together. We still have so much room to grow. And there's something else that I want to say. I know somebody may listen to this online years from now, and they probably need to hear this, so that's what I'm saying. There are many men who have a lot of education and that are very gifted, and they think they're above being helped by younger, less experienced uh, more immature believers. And that's wrong. Because as we read Scripture, God uses the humble in order to shame the wise. So there's no reason, no matter how long you've been teaching a Sunday school class, when you show up to the table and prepared, the Lord can use anybody in that class. Do you understand that? Every man needs to be humble. And recognize God uses younger, less experienced believers. Let me give you an example. There was a missionary by the name of William Carey. And he was a missionary to India. And he was really excited. And he had a, some younger Christians with him. And they were saying, you know, 
uh, Mr. Kerry, please don't go. Please don't go to India. It's, it's unsafe. And he wanted to encourage them. And he wanted them to continue to pray and support him, for them to really buy into the ministry. And this is what he said. He said, I will go down into the pit itself if you will hold the rope. Now, what does that mean? William Carey was a really mature guy, a really mature missionary, but he was saying, hey, I need your prayers. Even the young, inexperienced believers, he wanted them to buy into his ministry as he went to India. All right, again, overall, humility should be a mark in spiritual leadership. So maybe you're not married yet. Maybe you're looking towards a marriage. Maybe you're a man and you're like, you know, I hope one day to lead a family. You need to understand humility needs to be a part of your, uh, your character. And that should be an attribute in your life. All right, number six, a fruitful spirit. What does that mean? Look at verse 13. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. So what's he say? Verse 13. He says, I don't want you to be unaware. He's trying to call their attention to something. And then he says, I've often intended to come to you. So if it had been Paul's way, he would have already went to Rome. Why? Why does Paul want to go to Rome? He says that I may reap some harvest among you. What kind of harvest was Paul wanting to reap? I mean, what, what kind of fruit was there that Paul could harvest? Slaves. Right. So he's wanting to go to Rome to increase the number of converts, to increase not only converts, but spiritual growth in their life. Yeah. Very good. What do we learn from that? Well, it's pretty basic, and I bet most of us have overlooked it because it's so simple. In ministry, many work for money, for fame, for accolades, but that's not the reason why we work in ministry. It's not for money, crowds, or influence. A Christian who genuinely serves as unto the Lord strives only to be used by the Lord to bear spiritual fruit. Man, that's encouraging, right? Have you been a Sunday school teacher? Have you served in whatever capacity, and be, been able to harvest fruit? Have you ever had the opportunity to see someone come to faith in Christ? Have you ever led someone to Christ? Do you understand what joy that is to see someone, not just pray a prayer. That's all I'm talking about. I'm seeing someone that legitimately has been converted, and you begin to see them bear fruit in their life. And then you see them lead someone to Christ. Nothing is more rewarding than the joy of leading others to Christ or helping them to grow in the Lord. That's the fruit. That's a mark of spiritual leadership. Number seven, we're almost done. Number seven is obedience. Look at verse 14. He says, I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. One of the marks of a spiritual leader is being obedient. How? Now, I'm going to let you in on a little insider secret. There are times in ministry, pastoral ministry, where it is a joy to go into your study and to open up the Bible and to read and to study and to go way back into the mind and pull out this treasury from God's Word. And it is a joy. And, and that's the reward in and of itself. Then, there's times, when you, I'll be honest, you just don't want to study. <laughs> you don't want to. The work isn't very attractive. But an obedient servant of God goes into the mind anyways. Because he knows everyone else is at the job site. And they probably really want to be in the mind. But God's chosen him to go and study. So you go anyways. You still study. You still prepare. You still teach. You still shepherd even when you don't feel like it. You still answer the phone 
or you have the people over for supper that are going through marital issues and this and that and this why. It's not because it just is fun. It's because you're doing it out of obedience to Christ. A poor servant only serves whenever they want to. And a poor spiritual leader only serves when they want to. So here in verse number 14, he says this, I'm under obligation. What obligation was Paul referring to? Paul's obligation was to minister to the Gentiles and to minister to those in need. Paul had an obligation. It's kind of like the obligation that we have when someone's in danger. Paul, as a minister of the gospel, seen all these people that were headed towards hell, who were literally in spiritual danger. Many times in our life, we're also under an obligation when someone's in danger. I shared a story with you guys oh, it was probably last year. Now I'm not going to get into the whole story. Do you guys remember whenever we were coming back from North Carolina, we attempted to go on vacation, a church member passed away, so we turn around and come home, and we pull off at a McDonald's. You guys remember this? And we seen a young man running up the on-ramp, headed towards traffic going about 75 mile an hour. And there's a guy behind him, about 50 yards, who's stumbling and falling and can hardly get up, crying out, what are you doing? Stop, stop, stop. In that moment, I was under the obligation, something is wrong, there's no time just to sit around. So I run out there and pick the boy up and carried him back to his dad, who was like my same size. And what I found out was that the boy was autistic. And he was seeing a bird. And he was running after the bird. He didn't even understand what he was doing. There's moments like that in life in which we're under obligation to help. I, well, I lost my wedding ring years and years ago because I took uh, two bus loads of youth to a place called Deep Creek, North Carolina. Little boy had found himself underneath a waterfall, and there's so much water, it's beating him down under, he couldn't get his breath. Lost my wedding ring because of that. There's times in our life in which we're under obligation to act because people are in danger. So whenever you read here in verse number 14, I'm under obligation both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, what he's saying here is that when someone is in great danger and we're able to help, automatically and immediately, we are under obligation to do what we can to save them. Paul is under obligation to save those headed towards spiritual death. All right, let me fill in two blanks on your paper before we go on. The first one is Greeks. Greeks were educated in Greek learning and training in Greek culture, they were highly sophisticated. They, looked, they were looked at as being on a higher level than other people. They were the upper crust of society. Now, who were the barbarians? Those are people kind of, kind of like me, you know, uh, not steeped in learning and culture. They were the uneducated masses who were not Greek. So what's Paul saying here? He's saying, as a spiritual leader, your job is not just to go to a particular group of people. You're to broadcast a gospel seed to any and everyone who's willing to listen. Whether they are educated or uneducated. Whether it's the guy at the tire store or your pharmacist. You're called to talk to all of them about the hope that you have in Christ. The sophisticated who drink their coffee with their pinky out. You ever seen that? Oh, that was a joke, guys. Let's lighten up a little bit. There. The sophisticated and the simple. The privileged and the underprivileged. A spiritual leader takes the message to all of them. I wrote this on your paper, and I hope you'll remember it. The Gospel is a great equalizer. Every person is equally lost without it and equally saved with it. Doesn't matter where you come from, how much money you have in the bank, the gospel equals it. There's level ground, I guess is what I'm saying, at the foot of the cross. Number eight, an eager spirit. I said we're almost done. I promise we're almost done. Verse 15. 
So I am eager to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. A, a spiritual leader is like a racehorse. So the Kentucky Derby is coming. You see those horses in the gate, like they're ready to go. A spiritual leader is ready to share. He's ready to serve. Or like a sprinter at the starting blocks. That wasn't, I didn't enjoy stuff like that. But I guess that's a good illustration. Now, I promise you nine spiritual marks, but we'll see the next one next week. Uh, next week, we'll talk about a bold spirit. Don't pack up yet. Here, we'll keep going. Uh, verse 16 talks about a bold spirit. You see, Paul was headed to Rome. And in Rome, like, it's very possible that his life would be threatened. Yeah, he was bold. He understood that uh, basically he was eager to go. Like his life was Christ. If Christ chose to take it, so be it. Two questions and we're done. Number one, if you're a spiritual leader in here, if you serve in any capacity, are these eight marks that we've talked about tonight, do they ring true in your life? So it'd be easy to just say, well, that was a good lesson. Close it up and go to the house. But the reality is we're here to learn in order that we can apply. Sunday night should connect to Monday morning and how you live. Are these marks of biblical spiritual leadership true in your home and true in your church? If they're not true, something that needs to change. Start with repentance. Ask the Lord for forgiveness and ask those who you're supposed to be leading also for forgiveness. All right.